when I dropped out of music and then when I just sort of, you know, to do little bits of book reviewing and article here and there. Um, and then that was like about another 10 years before sort of the first book came out. Yeah. And it's been a quite a run since then, I would say. <laughs> yeah, last year. Yeah. Yeah. I've been actually wanting to, to talk with you for some time and, uh, I'm really think that this book really is a really great opportunity because it's, in my opinion, one of the best surveys of the Western esoteric tradition or traditions that I've seen by focusing on individuals and their histories and their ideas. Uh, but even more than that, what I love about this book is that it's not just a history and a narrative. You've you've kind of woven uh, many significant streams of philosophy and ideas, really amazing ideas throughout it. Um, I, I think the place I'd like to begin, if you don't mind, is um, talking about Jean Gebser and his mm. philosophies and how they apply to mm. what you're examining here. Mm -hmm. well, Jean Gebser was uh, uh, one, of these, um, one of these brilliant philosophers of the last century and, and really fascinating uh, character. Um, he was German and, and then sort of Swiss, Swiss by, you know, sort of, um, he adopted it. Um, it Switzerland became his adopted country. Um, but, um, yeah, he wrote an amazing book called The Ever-Present Origin, and um, which originally came out in sort of late 40s, but wasn't pop, uh, translated into English until the early 80s. And in it, he develops this idea of what he calls the structures of consciousness. And um, he sees these structures as more or less a, a further moving away from and differentiation from what he calls origin. And it's going to start to become rather sort of, you know, metaphysical soon. But it's this origin is a very difficult thing to actually you know, put into explicit terms. But it's some kind of ever present, ever being source of all kinds of, of, of all things and out of it. Um, over time, um, he traces these structures back, you know, sort of before our human period, while we were still part of these kind of hordes of, of, of simian creatures out on the out on the plains. Um, a kind of moving away from, as I said, differentiation. So the first sort of structure out of origin is the archaic, and you know, this is you know, there is still a kind of. Uh, deep unity with origin, and it's the it's the simplest, the barest, most kind of differentiation from from uh, this kind of unmanifest source. And then the next is something the magical, which uh, starts to have a bit more uh, sort of um, individual uh, kind of sense. And he relates uh, a kind of group consciousness to this um, structure. And the next is the mythic. And this would be um, the great, the great age of the great myths, and and the mother goddess, and um, uh, then following this is what he calls the mental rational. And the way these structures work is that they kind of have a kind of lifespan. They start out, uh, they have to struggle against sort of the the pre-existing structure that they're emerging from, and then they kind of come to full flowering. And then they start to sort of collapse on themselves and break down and make room for the next structure. And Gebser believed that we now in, in uh, early, well, he was saying this uh, last, the last people who said this to in the early 70s, he died in 73, um, that, you know, we, we were moving into or had already had been in for quite some time what he called the, uh, you know, um, breakdown of the mental rational consciousness structure, which is basically kind of dis dismantling of the of the sort of rational um, scientific view that's been in place for the last 400 years. Um, and how I use his ideas in the book is that I make an argument that, or at least suggest that it's worth looking at it in this way, that the shift um, from the, well, the, the, the sort of shift in consciousness that introduced the, the scientific age to the West in the early 1600s uh, so it was predicated on a kind of complete denial of the earl of, of the earlier hermetic, animistic, uh, magical uh, 
occult view of the world um, that saw it as more of a living being, saw it as the anima mundi, the, this kind of soul, um, and it had much more you know participatory experience of it. It, it interacted with it, and the new the new dispensation you know um, denied all that, and because it worked best when it it turned nature of the world into into an object, you know, something that was cold and neutral and it could apply its scientific method to. And what I want to say is the whole that hermetic tradition was a victim of this breakdown um, uh, of the mental, rational consciousness structure, which, you know, these things play out over, 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 you know, quite a long time. But I also want to say is where we are now, it seems to me that there's many signs of this kind of collapse of this mental, rational structure. Um, you know, from things from deconstructionism to to uh, iPhones and things like that, um, which I don't have to go into, but you have to take my word for it. And 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 there's also signs of a resurgence of interest in the old Hermetic uh, way, in a very broad sense, let's say in the New Age, but then in also more you know more specific um, and perhaps more um, serious serious ways. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to look at the whole history of the Western esoteric tradition going back, let's say, to the Egyptians or something like that, you know, the traditional kind of you know, roots of it up into contemporary times in terms of these sort of structures of consciousness. And there's another narrative as well, but I'll wait for you to ask me about it. No, that's all right. Um, I, I just think you, you make a really compelling argument, I think, for in the book for, for what you're stating here. So I would encourage people to, to read it, um, and to, to really investigate what you're talking about. Um, but one of the things I wanted to ask you about is this sort of, uh, rational, scientific mindset, if you will, uh, attacking, you know, as you mentioned, on one sense, uh, the hermetic tradition, uh, obviously it attacked probably several others along the way. Um, but um, it, it was my sense you, you also find this analogous to the way our own brain functions. Mm, mm, mm. Well, I was going to say, that's the other you know, this sort of narrative um, that I'm using to tell the story. And it comes from a wonderful book that came out a few years ago called The Master and His Emissary um, by Ian McGilchrist. And Ema Gilchrist is a neuroscientist, but he's also an English scholar. And what the book does is revamp the left brain, right brain sort of story that, um, as we know, was very popular a while ago and then sort of kind of fell into decline uh, for various reasons, one of which is precisely because it became so popular. Um, but what Gilchrist does in his book is that he shows that, yes, even though it turns out that both sides of the brain do a lot of the same things, you know, their, their tasks aren't neatly sort of divided as um, was once thought. There is a difference still because they, it's not what they do, it's how they do it. And they do it in very different ways. And um, the way that the left brain does it is by breaking down experience, it analyzes it, it turns it into bits and pieces, it makes it familiar, um, it uh, sort of makes it numerical, mechanical, um, predictable, and um, it's and it does all these things because its basic aim is sort of to help us survive in the world. Um, it's, it's, its aim is to sort of make the world manageable um, up for us. Um, and it's the material it works on is presented to it by the right side of the brain, um, which sees things um, in terms of holes. It sees patterns and connections, and it sees things um, simultaneously all at once, rather than um, breaking it down into sequence as the way the left brain does. And when I was reading McGilchrist's book, um, one of the things that struck me, and is the sort of the main um, sort of thrust of his of his story is that he says there's this kind of rivalry going on between the two sides of the brain. And this is how they work. They kind of inhibit each other's excesses. And there's a kind of amiable, you know, kind of rivalry that, that goes on. But um, he's saying every now and then the left brain gets a bit uppity and kind of takes takes over and tries to become dominant. And he feels that in the last 200 years or whatever, a little bit more, whatever, going back to the, certainly by the Industrial Revolution, although probably the roots of it are 
or I would say a little bit earlier, and I and I say in, in the book um, that the left brain has been sort of busily kind of uh, recreating the world around it in terms of itself. Um, so we now, you know, 200 years after this got got going, we live in a world that's very much made in the fashion of how the left brain likes to see things and, and how to deal with things, you know, very manageable, very, you know, sort of numerical, sequential and, um, um, you know, bits and pieces and so on and so on. And the problem with this is that there's very little left for the right brain to sort of interact with. I mean, the, the right brain is very much about the immediacy of things. It's, it's, it's about being rather than doing. It's, it's not geared towards survival and, and, um, practical, um, sort of uses. It's, it, it, it um, has a kind of, you know, immediate uh, grasp of the reality of things, a sort of isness, mm -hmm. that, um, and so on. And so what I, I say in the book is that, um, well, I was going to say one more thing. There's another book that I, I talk about called um, The Alphabet Versus the Goddess by a fellow named Leonard Schlein, um, who died some years ago. But he makes a similar argument in basically saying that, yes, he talks about a kind of tussle going on between the two sides of the brain, which he sees in terms of the rise of the alphabet um, as a left brain sort of device and the earlier image oriented, more right brain um, kind of consciousness. But I bring him in because he too sees a kind of struggle going on. And so it struck me if there is that sort of thing going on, you know, where else would the left brain, you know, strike, you know, what, what else would it go after? And then it struck me that, well, it certainly would go after the Western esoteric tradition, the whole body of ideas and beliefs and philosophies associated with it, because they, it seems to me, are very much in the same character of the way in which the right brain perceives the world. They're, they're, they, they seem to me a kind of right brain body of knowledge, let's say, mm -hmm. and which I call in the book rejected knowledge. I'm taking the, the term from um, borrowing it from the the. the um, historian of the occult, James Webb, um, um, who died many, many years ago, but um, he, he uses this phrase, rejected knowledge, and, and some, in one of his uh, books. And um, it's this whole idea, there's a whole body of knowledge, a whole kind of tradition, philosophies, and ways of thinking, and all that. It's not just rubbish, it's not just, you know, collection of odds and ends and spells. It's a whole ontology, it's a whole metaphysic, it's a whole epistemology uh, that, you know, has been rejected. And it's rejected precisely by this new rising um, at the time, back in the 1600s, form of consciousness. This this new kind of um, um, you know, not new. Well, it, it's it's you know it's new, but it's 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 you know this is left brain consciousness that that's, that's coming into its own and 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 basically becoming dominant. And um, one of the things about with Gebser is that when um, the structure of consciousness starts to break down. It also has this kind of final efflorescence, you know, when it's sort of becomes even more itself, mm -hmm. kind of overripe. And you can see the kind of hyper rationality that um, accompanied the rise of the, and, and helped pave the way for the rise of the scientific method, let's say. Certainly. It's, it's, it's very much like that, you know. Um, and and so so that's kind of the general thing. So and so I take those ideas and kind of make a narrative out of those. Um, the kind of the wheels that move the story on, looking at one calling them secret teachers, various people who have dipped into this body of or or you know more than dipped in. They created you know great great portions of it, um, and um, see how actually how much of that is actually influence the world we live in today you know mm -hmm. um, there's, there's signs of it and, and i don't mean in some conspiracy theory way just in the actual you know things around us in the world um and how some things we don't know anything about them at all and you know they should be better known and so on and so on so this is a motif about this kind of rejected knowledge and the adherence and the devotees of it and and the and, and the uh, agents of it let's say and it's Throughout most of its history, really, up up until you know this time, 1600s, it's 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 well known. It's prestigious. It's it's you know it's not it's not considered as we consider it today, woo woo, you know, wacky sort of uh, crazy stuff. It, you know, Isaac Newton, you know, as everyone knows today, but you know, it was a big surprise when we first found out. You know, he he was deeply into alchemy, Kabbalah, um, you know, and so on and so on. Mm -hmm. And gravity was kind of sidelined. You know, right. Before. 
Um, so this stuff is there. And 